This video covers two relatively small groups that are found in an important phylogenetic position that indicates some uh, interesting evolutionary transitions in body form. So the animals we've covered thus far have included the basal lineages, the Lophotrochozoans, and we've just gotten into the Ecdysozoans, so we're still in the Protostomia. We covered the roundworms, the nematoda, in the last lecture. And in this lecture, we're going to cover the basal lineages of the, what are called the panarthropoda. Synapomorphies for this group include a reduced coelom that instead has been replaced by a very extensive hemocele. And a hemocele is basically a blood cavity. So the two tags we're going to cover in this lecture are the onychophrons, which are called the velvet worms, and the tardate grotta, which are the water bears. These are two relatively small clades that are, again, at the base of the panarthropoda that show some interesting transitions from some of the worm-like organisms we've talked about in the past to some more of the arthropod-like characteristics. So the tardigrades are called the water bears, and there are about 900 species of these that are teeny tiny. Most of them are less than a millimeter in length. They tend to be found primarily in freshwater algae, terrestrial moss, and lichen situations, but there are some that also exist in the marine interstitial environment. And what an interstitial animal is, is it's a tiny animal that lives in the sediment in between the spaces of sand grains and broken shells, so teeny tiny um, little spaces. The other group is the onychophrons, the velvet worms, and there are only about 70 species of these found in rain forest leaf litter and decaying logs. So members of both these groups are triploblastic eucelomates, so they do have a true coelom, but it is greatly reduced and instead is replaced by a hemocil. They are very bilaterally symmetrical, and most of them do show very extensive cephalization. As you can see here, clear head end on this water bear and the clear head end on this velvet worm. Both these groups have a relatively thin, flexible cuticle. In the case of the water bears, it is, does not contain chitin. Uh, chitin is a, an important polysaccharide that is the primary part of the exoskeleton of, of arthropods, but it's not seen in the water bears, but it is seen in the cuticle associated with the velvet worms. These are ecdysozoans, so they do have to shed these cuticles, but it's a kind of bizarre pattern in velvet worms where they actually shed it in patches. There is no solid support besides the relatively flexible cuticle that the individuals have. Instead, most of the support is coming from the muscle uh, wall itself, plus the hydrostatic pressure that's created by the internal hemocell. They both have relatively complex muscular systems. The, there are uh, clear longitudinal and oblique muscle bands, as you can see here in the water bears, but water bears do lack circular muscles. In velvet worms, there is more substantial muscle development uh, across the entire body wall, and it includes muscle fibers in virtually all directions, longitudinal and including circular. Water bears have a very large brain relative to the organisms we've talked about thus far, and they have clear cephalization with lots of concentration of nervous material in the head end, including eyes. They have a nerve ring that surrounds the uh, pharynx. It's not really shown here because really they're only showing you half of the nervous system. The nerve ring connects two ventral nerve cords, and again, this is just showing one of these nerve cords running the length of the body. Again, you can see the very large brain, and you can see that there are enlargements of the formation of ganglia uh, in the ventral nerve cord associated with each of the four pairs of legs that we see in water bears. Similar complexity is seen in the velvet worms with a large brain, a ladder-like nervous system running the length of the body where they have the two ventral nerve cords um, with these uh, interconnecting neurons. Again, they show quite a bit of cephalization. They have tubercles with tactile bristles covering much of their body. But if you do look at the head end, uh, there is a concentration of both chemo and sensory structures so we have these tentacles or antenna. They're labeled differently in, in different text. At the base of these, there are eyes. And then they also have these uh, hygroscopic 
sensors that are concentrated in the head end that are specific for detection of water, which is important for these organisms because they live in moist environments and they have to stay in moist environments so they don't dry out. These are very mobile organisms. Water bears have four pair of ventrally located clawed legs, unjointed appendages, and you can see them here. They're relatively slow, awkward crawlers, but they uh, are mobile. You also see similar unjointed ventrally located clawed legs in the velvet worms, and they use um, a little bit more refined movement by using very controlled muscular waves of, of contractions going anterior to posterior, and there is also muscular control of the individual clawed leg that can kind of reach forward and move the organism. Water bears are uh, both herbivores and predators of small invertebrates. Some are also showing some parasitic relationships, as there are some symbiotic forms. The velvet worms are primarily active at night, for many of the reasons we talked about annelids being uh, terrestrial and active at night because of less chance of drying out. They are predators of relatively large organisms like annelids, snails, and other arthropods. One of the feeding structures that they have that is, uh, enables them to subdue their prey are these oral papilla connected to slime glands where they can shoot these streams of sticky slime that uh, harden very quickly and this allows them to immobilize prey and then forage on them uh, at their leisure. Both the taxa have muscular pharynxes and relatively simple, complete digestive tracts. The water bears have sucking mouth parts, so they're like little vacuum cleaners, and they uh, forage on the fluids of their prey by at first piercing the, the prey with these uh, sharp stylets, which are stored here, as you can see, associated with the pharynx. The velvet worms have ventrally located mouths with these internal pair of jaws for chewing on their prey. As I mentioned, um, these do have a very extensive hemocyl and an open circulatory system. So there is a very limited series of blood vessels connected to the heart, but other than that, blood just circulates around this hemocyl. This is actually a synapomorphy for the panarthropoda, which is uh, going to include the arthropods themselves, which we're going to start covering in the next lecture. And in most of the panarthropoda, there is a pumping heart that moves the blood through the hemocyl. Water bears are the exception to that. They're small enough where they don't have a heart. Just the movement of their body itself is enough for circulation through the hemocyl. Again, because the water bears are so small, they don't have a respiratory system. They um, can exchange gases simply through diffusion. The velvet worms do have a tracheal tube system, a system of, of branching tubes that run throughout the body and deliver oxygen and take away CO2 from individual little pockets of tissue and are connected to the exterior through these little holes called spiracles. Now we'll see that when we get into some of the arthropods that have a similar tracheal tube system, the spiracles are able to open and close to, and this helps to regulate their gas exchange while at the same time limiting their exposure to, to desiccating uh, dry environments. That's not the case here with the velvet worms. Their, their spiracles have to stay open all the time, and that's probably why they, one of the main reasons they are restricted to very wet environments, tropical environments. Whether this tracheal tube system in the velvet worms is really homologous with that seen in arthropods is, is not clear. It may be a case of convergent evolution. Members of both these groups handle nitrogenous waste in different ways. So as far as excretion goes, the water bears have malpighian tubules that collectively absorb water throughout the body and then selectively resorb certain salts and nutrients that the body wants to keep and then they concentrate the nitrogenous waste that are then dumped into the back part, the posterior part of the digestive tract as you can see or the back part of the intestines. This again may be homologous to the Malpighian tubule system seen in arthropods. The velvet worms however have paired nephridia which would be classified as metanephridia associated with each of the pairs of legs. So they connect to the, the bases of each of these pairs of legs. And this is the primary mechanism how they get rid of their nitrogenous waste. But the midgut uh, can also concentrate nitrogenous waste and mix it with the feces. And as in all the previous organisms we've talked about, these are ectothermic lineages. Reproduction is very interesting in some of these groups. The water bears are 
in some species are there are no males known and as a species they can only reproduce parthenogenetically so females produce diploid eggs in some species though they do show males and females so they are dioecious and they show internal fertilization following copulation or in some cases males will actually inject sperm into the female's body wall and then the sperm migrate through the hemocyl um, into the oviduct. Water bears produce these really ornate eggs and the egg laying, so they're oviparous and they, they lay their eggs oftentimes at the same time that they are going through ecdysis when they're molting. And so they actually use the molted case as a protective kind of wrapper around the developing eggs, as you can see here. This is a molted cuticle associated with a water bear that has also placed her eggs in there. As far as velvet worms go, uh, one species is also known to be parthenogenetic, but all other species are known to be dioecious. Not really known much about their mating behavior, except in one species they do know that the males pr produce a packet of sperm called a spermatophore, and they actually just place it on top of the female, on uh, her epidermis, and this actually dissolves through her epidermis, where the sperm then enter the hemocyl and again swim to the uh, ovaries for fertilization of the eggs. Now in the case of the water bears, they were primarily oviparous as I mentioned, but in the case of the velvet worms, most of these are ovoviviparous uh, and viviparous. So they uh, hold their young internally, either developing in eggs or directly connected to the maternal blood supply so that they can uh, derive nutrients as they develop. There's quite a bit of variation in cleavage patterns seen in these two groups. So the water bears primarily show holoblastic and radial cleavage, which radial cleavage is typically more associated with deuterosomes, but this is still in the protosome plate, so that's kind of a bizarre thing uh, that's seen in water bears and confused uh, people a long time about the placement of water bears, given that in, in many other cases they seem to fit closer to the panarthropoda groups. But genetically, this placement still makes sense. So this seems to be a secondary uh, derivation of radial cleavage. The blastopore uh, does become the mouth, which is typical what you would see in a protostome, and they don't produce larvae. There is direct development of young. In the velvet worms, there's more variation in cleavage patterns. So some of them are, do show holoblastic cleavage if they're more isolesethyl, but some of them are more centralesethyl with very thick yolks, and so these tend to seem, send more meroblastic cleavage. And there's actually quite a bit of variation within velvet worms. Some have more spiral-like cleavage and some show radial cleavage patterns. Another bizarre developmental trait is the fact that the blastopore actually becomes the anus in velvet worms. And so again, this is more of a deuterostome characteristic, so a secondary apparent derivation of this developmental pattern. And like the water bears, there is direct development of young, no larval forms. One of the interesting characteristics of tardigrades is they can form these adult forms that can stay in stasis for many, many years, and we call this process cryptobiosis. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The velvet worm, and so this can allow them to actually exist for many, many years. Velvet worms actually showed relatively slow maturation. They can wait to develop until about 14 months in one species, and they can live for multiple years. So a little bit more about cryptobiosis that's seen in water bears. They slowly reduce their water content in challenging environments. So if, if things are drying up, they'll slowly let their water content dry up, and they go through this dormant phase where they reduce their water content from 85% to only about 3%. And in this stage, they um, use these specific polysaccharides to stabilize their proteins, and are incredibly resistant to extreme environmental conditions uh, when they're in cryptobiotic state. It's been shown that they can um, deal with temperatures as low as minus 272 degrees Celsius and temperatures as high as 149 degrees Celsius. So incredible range of temperatures in which in this state that they can exist uh, without dying. They can uh, also exist for extremely long periods of time with uh, virtually no oxygen. They can resist ionizing radiation. So they're, they've been put through the ringer in a lot of experiments to see what it takes to kill them, and they really are just going to be survivors. 
The defenses associated with velvet worms are the same ones that they use for foraging. So if they're disturbed, their oral papilla can shoot out these streams of defensive slime material um, to dissuade any potential predator. The velvet worms do show group living in some species in Australia, it's been demonstrated, and they actually even work together in coordinated hunting behaviors to track down and subdue prey. As far as symbiotic relationships, there's not a lot of these that are known, but there are some water bears that are both parasites of, of echinoderms and some crustaceans. As far as habitat goes, I've kind of mentioned this already. The water bears are freshwater algae, terrestrial moss, lichens, just really moist environments, and some are interstitial in the marine environment. Velvet worms are restricted to really humid environments because of their uh, tracheal tube system and those open spiracles. They live in humid forest floor habitats in tropical and subtropical regions. And again, they restrict their activity primarily at night um, because of this limitation of needing to stay in human conditions. So in review, these are triploblastic UC made organisms with flexible cuticles that they have to shed or molt, so they undergo ecdysis. They don't have any solid structural support, so it's primarily hydrostatic, muscular, and cuticular, but they do have extensive muscles, more developed in the velvet worms, because there's a lack of circular muscles in the tardigrades. They have a well-developed, kind of ladder-like nervous system running the length of their body with a, a large brain and clear degrees of cephalization with many sensory structures concentrated at the end, but they also do have mechanoreceptors spread throughout their body, uh, typically associated with their legs. As far as locomotion, again, they have the well-developed muscular system, and then they have these unjointed ventral clawed appendages. And the ventral position is, is key because this allows them to have more efficient crawling behavior in the terrestrial environment. Members of both groups can be predators, and in the case of the water bear, some of them are herbivores. And in this situation, the water bears uh, have sucking mouth parts with stylets that they use to pierce their prey or the, the food, the plants that they could be eating, the algae. And the velvet worms have these oral papilla connected to slime glands where they can spray uh, quite a long distance these jets of slime to subdue their prey and also use it as a defense mechanism. They have complete digestive tract. They have an open circulatory system with an extensive hemocyl, and again, this is a synapomorphy for the panarthropoda itself. And most of them do have hearts, but the water bears lack a heart because they're small enough that just movement can move fluid through the hemocyl. Same thing for respiration. Water bears don't really need anything. They can get by with just diffusion, but the velvet worms have a tracheal tube system similar to that seen in some of the other arthropods except their spiracles these external openings in the epidermis are always open and so they have a tendency to dry out if they're not in really humid wet conditions as far as getting rid of nitrogenous waste water bears have malpighian tubules which concentrate nitrogenous waste and dump it into the back part of the digestive tract the velvet worms have metanephridae associated with their legs and they can also do a little bit of nitrogenous concentration um, in their gut. Members of both groups sometimes show parthenogenesis. Some species are known only as females, but species seen in both groups are also dioecious, showing internal fertilization, sometimes with copulation or with injection of sperm hypodermically or simply dissolving through the epidermis, where the sperm then have to swim through the hemocyl to reach the ovaries for fertilization. Water bears are oviparous, and the velvet worms are either ovoviviparous or viviparous, providing a little bit of initial parental care for their developing young. As far as development goes, we see some varied and kind of surprising cleavage patterns and blastopore fates seen in these groups that would not be predicted within a protostome clade, probably secondary modifications of these developmental styles, but all do show direct development because they're primarily terrestrial organisms. They do show some interesting defense and um, relatively long lifespans because of these. So the, the water bears can show cryptobiosis and the defensive slime associated with the oral papilla that are seen in the velvet worms. Velvet worms do show some interesting social behaviors. And members of both these groups are typically restricted to moist terrestrial habitats, but there are some aquatic 
representatives of water bears, both in freshwater and the marine environment, marine interstitial environment. 